who is going to talk about the change we require, how citizen science is reshaping our understanding of medicine and nutrition. So let's slam our hands together vehemently for Billy. So the uh, so my talk, if uh, this advances, which it's not, yeah. All right. Is yes, this is the change that requires uh, citizen science is reshaping our understanding of medicine and nutrition. And what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, let me give you my disclosures and. Let me give you a quick bio. Really, a lot of you guys already pretty much know me by this point. Um, <laughs> I'm an obsessive and a one software engineer who really gets uh, a lot of joy for some reason in being poked by needles. <laughs> and really, the only thing that changes on this is the high score, which I'm sure you're all very interested in, and it's up to 118 in the last 44 months. Uh, so, uh, Siobhan's, by the way, trying to catch up with me. I don't know how well she's going to do. We'll see in time. Well, it's 2019, and I want to help to kind of lay a landscape that many of you guys need to understand to better understand where I'm coming from for this talk. And right now, we believe in organizations. And what do I mean by that? Well, there's a kind of official organizational advantage. And by that, I mean we're wired to consolidate information to, because we prefer to learn about what we are passionate about, but we rely on trusted sources for the things we're not passionate about. And this, this makes a lot of sense. It's how we're actually built. It's why specialization is so great. And so sources that are trusted by the majority of people often enjoy a greater automatic acceptance, such as large official organizations. This is a fictional one. Well, let's just say you wanted to get into underwater basket weaving. You probably right now could find a society of underwater basket weaving and they probably have a lot of materials available for you online right now. And this is kind of key because some organizations can be less concerned with, with responding to scrutiny unless overwhelming data accumulates against their position. That can be a bit of a challenge. So with that in mind, this is the information ecosystem that we imagine. We think, hey, there's all these expert studies that are actually being built and they're very sciencey, but you know what? We may not be as into that subject, so fortunately we have a lot of experts themselves who can help us with this. How do they help us with this? Well, they actually help to develop a simple explanation and advice that they can then bring to us, the masses. And you know what's even better? What's even better, and if you think about it, is actually a modern phenomenon. It's never really happened quite like it has in the last few decades, is what if these experts band together on a particular discipline, not just underwater basket weaving, but let's say cardiovascular disease and diabetes, wouldn't it be great if they kind of get together and then they help to develop these documents for us to share and understand a little bit better for ourselves? Naturally, I'm going to go ahead and pick an example we're all very familiar with, a simple explanation and advice that would be the food pyramid. Now certainly a lot of you guys in this room are going to be opinionated about the food pyramid, but this, this is in fact something for which there was enormous amounts of input on. I, I certainly recommend you read Taubes and Teichholz and uh, many of the different uh, documentaries that helped to show how this all came together. But it definitely had a lot of experts that weighed in before we finally got this particular document. And look, this is developing a kind of two populations that I like to call confident mainstreamers and alternative thinkers. And the confident mainstreamer, they're, they're very much the product of this process. And to be fair, we are confident mainstreamers ourselves in many disciplines outside of this. If you look at it, we're brand loyal to certain things like say Apple and Microsoft and so forth. And so we like the digest version that we get from experts that we trust in the field. So I call these the confident mainstreamer. But sometimes, if the, the confident mainstreamer isn't developed, you end up getting through this other knowledge pathway, what I like to call the alternative thinker. And especially when it comes to things like medicine and nutrition, the alternative thinker says, ah, actually, I kind of want to go and look at the evidence myself. I kind of want to form my own opinion, just based on what it is that I can come up with, even though I'm not an expert. 
And then I'll have my own alternative hypothesis. Okay, so here's the catch. Confident mainstreamers have strength in numbers. And this makes sense. Because after all, there's a lot more people who are willing to take the existing expert advice than there are those who are going to actually look into the subject themselves and become well-educated in what it means. And that's somewhat understandable because, look, let's face it, alternative thinkers come in a wide spectrum. Some have many theories that are easily falsified. There, you certainly know some people who have a different opinion of what you'd see from experts that you'd go, nah, I don't think I would trust that, no. But conversely, there are some who have alternative ideas that ultimately turn out to be valid. Now, here's where it gets interesting. There's also now a more common new phenomenon. Where are the experts, especially if they're part of an organization, get involved in this conversation, especially over social media? They often throw further confidence to the confident mainstreamers and say, that's right, and you're following the guidelines properly, you're doing a good job. But likewise, they also participate and go quick looking at these kooks. They are not the tops of the field. You've got to quit bothering with listening to those people who don't share the information that we're sharing to you. But, as I said from a little bit earlier, and this is key, you need to remember this. Some organizations can be less concerned with responding to scrutiny unless overwhelming data accumulates against their position. This is super relevant. With that in mind, let me talk about formal and citizen science. And this is basically my own divide, but I think a lot of you would probably agree. Formal science, it typically will be funded by institutions or industry, often a combination of both. Citizen science is typically self-funded. Uh, formal science, is generally, it's generally directed and staffed by formal credentialed scientists, where, of course, citizen science is generally conducted by non-trained scientists. And on the formal side, there's usually involvement with official bodies like the IRB, which you're not going to see as often on the citizen science side. And this is perhaps the most important. Formal science seeks to end up in the literature. They want it to be published in scientific journals, whereas citizen science is generally seeking to, ex to share these experiments through social media forums and blogs. Now, if you're looking at this snapshot before everything I just told you, it's totally understandable why you would trust those people on the left side over those people on the right side. It makes sense. And you need to understand this moving forward. But who are, the or who are these citizen scientists? You are. You are. You are. You're all citizen scientists. I've anointed you right now. Now, let me actually give you a very distinctive example. This is, of course, very personal to me. And to Siobhan, who helps us run the Cholesterol Code website. And look, we just have this very, very basic message we want to test. We want to say, look, isn't it possible that high cholesterol might make sense if it's for a metabolic reason? And what we'd like to do is we'd like to bring that to medical professionals, especially as they come to see more and more low-carbers. But that's a challenge, because guess what? These same medical professionals, they're parts of these organizations or take advice from the organizations or other experts and have got very different training. And you need to empathize with both the organizations and the medical uh, professionals as to why that happens. But here's where it gets interesting. This is an indirect pathway. As they get more and more low-carb patients, the patients happen to get a lot more of our information, and then they end up directing it back to the medical professionals. So we have this great phenomenon where basically most medical professionals learn about cholesterol code and begin to follow the work after one or more patients bring it to their attention. That's pretty fascinating because now the direction of flow goes the other way. We now have more than ever non-low-carb clinicians that approach us about the research, wanting to know and understand it better for their low-carb patients. That's quite phenomenal. But I actually want to use one of my favorite examples because this is very personal to me. And this has to do with something I read before I went on the low-carb diet. And this is actually from the American Diabetes Association. This, they had a myths page. I wanted to really investigate whether or not I needed carbohydrates. And on this myths page in January 2014, was when, which is when I read it, it says, Myth, if you have diabetes, you should only eat small amounts of starchy foods such as bread, potatoes, and pasta. 
As you can see in here, and this is looking at it through the Wayback Machine, a place to start is about 45 to 60 grams of carbohydrates per meal or three to four servings of carbohydrate containing foods. Show of hands, who will have at least 45 grams of carbs at all today? <laughs> exactly. So, what happened is I then went through the Wayback Machine. It's a great, it's a great uh, device, by the way, a uh, great website that you can work through older pages. I found the first instance where this actually changed materially. And it wasn't until January of 2018. In January 18, this, this page and this particular myth, the text had changed to now say, wondering how much carbohydrates you can have, the amount of carbohydrate you need will vary based on many factors. And that's definitely a very distinctive change. And even then, I'll bet some people are going to quibble with the knee word, but one step at a time, right? So look, I have this term I like. I like to call it the pivotal patient. And I think I started thinking of it that way as I listened to, say, Ted Naiman and David Unwin. They all have a story of how they were a conventional doctor first, and then they had a particular patient, a particular low-carb patient, who they observed seemed to it thrive so amazingly from going on a low-carb diet, and it started to change their whole perspective. And I want all of you, all of you to realize you could be the next pivotal patient to another conventional doctor who may then become low-carb, but I do have some advice, and it's advice that I hope you'll appreciate. First, respect your doctor. Even if you strongly disagree with them, advocate for good data, careful research, and request that they do the same respectfully. Understand this can take time and have patience, but, and this is the most important, as always, listen to every productive side of the debate with an open mind. As you probably, those of you who follow me on social media, you know that I'm constantly engaging those people of a different opinion and genuinely requesting whatever information they can bring because indeed I could have missed things that may change my own worldview. Okay, what about the timeliness of science? Because this is also very relevant to us thinking about it from a citizen science perspective. And I want to bring one of my favorite examples up. Many of you may already know this story. This is Barry Marshall, who himself is a scientist, and he connected with Robin Warren as a pathologist, this was in the 80s, uh, who was interested in gastritis. Together they developed a hypothesis that peptic ulcers and gastric cancer could have a causal pathway from H. pylori. This was so radical in the 80s because so many people didn't think there was any way it could survive stomach acid. They submitted their initial findings to their peers, and it was received extremely poorly. They were laughed at. It was actually, I think, in the, top, in the bottom 10% uh, uh, everywhere they submitted. So basically what happened was in 1984, Marshall got a baseline endoscopy done to confirm no ulcers. And what did he do? Does anyone know? Yes. He then consumed broth containing cultured H. pylori, expecting to develop an ulcer in one or more years. Actually, he saw symptoms within days, including nausea, vomiting, and I always mess up that word, but basically bad breath, bad breath. By day eight, a new endoscopy showed massive inflammation, and a biopsy showed H. pylori had colonized his stomach. Naturally, he and Warren were then immediately lavished with praise, and here's all the awards that he got immediately following, including a Nobel Prize shortly thereafter. The reason there's some laughter here is because some who know the story knows this slide is exactly false by about one decade. The first known award I was able to find was in 1994, fully 10 years after he had demonstrated this change physically with his own body. That's quite astonishing. But on top of that, the Nobel Prize ultimately came in 2005, 19 years after he done, sorry, 21 years, gotta get my math right. Uh, and to be sure, I would expect a Nobel Prize to take time to ultimately award, but what was fascinating was, and if you read this story, even after it was demonstrated, it didn't actually change that much of their attention. One scientist who was kind of arguing with, with me about it tried to look and find something that can refute that and said, well, actually, there does seem to be a, a new level of interest that showed up about three years after he had done that experiment. And he said, that's, that's practically overnight in science. I was like, really? My research is about three years old, so I guess I started yesterday. 
Okay, the moral of the story is that scientific acceptance takes a lot of time. Or does it? Well, hold that thought. Because now I want to talk for a second about lean mass hyperresponders. Or what I would like to call lean mass hyper-citizen scientists. So, for a recap, for those of you who are not familiar, there are a subset of those people who are on a low-carb diet who will see their total and LDL cholesterol go up. And there's a subset of those who we like to call hyper-responders that are lean mass hyper-responders. They often have, will tend to have the highest LDL, but it's also matched with a couple of other metrics, which I'll talk about here. They tend to have an LDL of 200 or higher, an HDL of 80 or higher, and triglycerides of 70 or lower. And what do they have in common? I'm gonna use the laser just for just this one moment. They tend to be very low carb. They tend to have very low body fat. And they tend to be athletic and fit. But this is more observational. Not everybody meets all of these criteria. Bottom line is, this does tend to be what we find that's typical. And I'll show you, because this is the banner for the Lean Mass Hyperresponder Facebook group. If you didn't know any better, you would think that this Facebook group was all based around fitness and trying to get cut. But no, what brought everybody to this Facebook group was actually their lipid numbers, their cholesterol tests. That's quite astonishing. This is one of those lean mass hyperresponders. This is Mick. And that picture of him to the left is actually his after picture, after he had gone paleo. But even after going paleo, he still had a number of problems that he was still trying to resolve. And so eventually he went keto. But as he went keto, he saw that his lipid numbers changed substantially. You want to see how Mick looks today? This is Mick today. And he's in his 60s, by the way. I hope I look half as good as Mick does when I get to my 60s. I don't look that good now. <laughs> So this, by the way, is Mick doing a pull-up with near-perfect form, something he's never been able to do in his life, and I, I'm actually sure I can do right now. <laughs> These are his cholesterol numbers. His total cholesterol is 620. His LDL is 492. His HDL is 112, and his triglycerides are 59. Now, to be sure, he's a little more of an outlier. He tends to be a little bit at the higher level. But he also exhibits many of those attributes I was telling you about earlier. Very lean, very fit, and he's very low carb. Let me also introduce you to April. Now, unlike Nick, April has actually been an athlete her whole life. But she's kind of just put up with the fact that she would probably be a little more of a padded athlete. She's just never been able to lose enough fat. And that was just something that she came to accept until she'd gone keto, because this is April today. This is another one where it was just a year before. And then this is actually a video of hers, one that I saw posted to Facebook that really showed a difference because, again, this is for just one year earlier. And the reason I like this comparison video is because you would have expected, if you saw a still of this, that the person on the left was probably stronger than the person on the right. Not so. She's much stronger and leaner on the right side. And if you look closely, if you watch how much she is uh, breathing and so forth, you can see she just has greater control overall. Her life was radically changed by low carb. But these are her numbers. Total cholesterol 505, LDL of 411, HDL of 76, triglycerides of 89. Both Mick and April and many of the people in the low carb, uh, in the lean mass hyperresponder Facebook group are very adherent and very interested and maintaining this because they feel like it's changed their lives so much. And here's my prediction. My prediction is lean mass hyperresponders will change everything. Everything. Because never has there been a cohort that could test the lipid hypothesis like lean mass hyperresponders. They are truly unique citizen scientists. Kind of like Barry, they're taking on something that might be considered right now to be of extraordinary risk. And I want to emphasize something. This is very important. I'm not making the claim that lean mass hyperresponders are okay. That's part of why we're going to be able to study them. But likewise, has there never been a time for which the empowerment for them to find each other and to organize through social media and networking? We started this Facebook group a year ago. I still can't believe this. We're up to 3,200 members. And 92, I just took this screenshot last night. We had 92 this week. That's bananas. I can't believe that. It's low-carb bananas, by the way. 
The study that I'm speaking of, I believe that it'll change everything. I'm trying to work extremely hard to get a long-term follow-up study for lean mass hyperresponders. Uh, people I'm talking to are like Spencer Nadolsky and Ethan Weiss. While I like to say I'm cautiously optimistic about having high LDL for metabolic reasons, they're cautiously pessimistic. But that's not, in my opinion, a bug. That's a feature. I would like for there to be more collaboration, not just between those people of different viewpoints, but yes, between citizen scientists and formal scientists. Just one follow-up study from lean mass hyperresponders could have a seismic shift in our understanding of lipids, metabolism, and mortality risk. Now what happens when a citizen scientist like me gets a hold of a large data set, like in Haines? What's, what's in Haines? In Haines is the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. And let me tell you, it was a huge game changer when I was fortunate enough to have Tommy Wood and his team be able to put together a data set for me. They actually did a lot of the, the legwork in getting it together so that I could then finally get it into a spreadsheet and start playing with it. And I did. Played with it quite a bit. But before I dive in, a few important caveats. This analysis is preliminary, and I'm going to be very upfront. I'm not an epidemiologist or statistician, so this will be quite basic, but then that's what I wanted all along. You know that, that graph I showed you earlier where it's showing how there's all the digestion that's going on, particularly for the studies. I wanted to look at raw data. I'm an engineer. I want to get under the hood. I want, I want to actually see the process for myself. For that matter, I wanted to see raw data analysis as minimally modified as possible. And that's what I'm going to show you now. All constructive criticism, by the way, is welcome, but, but emphasis on constructive. So, all the adjustments I made are on this slide. All of them. And they're all, in my opinion, very defensible. First of all, I did, of course, grab everybody who was eligible. That means everybody 18 and up. It goes from, the data set goes from 18 to 85. And then I subtracted everybody who had any missing lipid data. And then finally, the last thing is I subtracted everyone who had triglycerides over 400 because the common Friedwald equation, which is the most common one they use to calculate LDLC, doesn't allow for triglycerides over 400. That's it. And what you end up with is a total of 40,444. Plenty of people. I will tell you, didn't find any lean mass hyperspotters. There were like two. That's a new phenomenon, of course. So, this is the graph that had me almost fall out of my chair. Basically what I did was, I went to try to find age parity, so in comparing against the different LDL groups, they had about the same age, since age is, after all, a risk factor for death. Do kind of want to make sure that's all set up. Okay, but on top of that, I also wanted to get about what the mortality percent was per year because follow-up times could be different. And as you can see, as you can see, all the way to the left, the first grouping, 0 through 79 LDL, when their blood was taken and they had this number, they had an average mortality rate of about 3.1% per year. The next one over, that's 80 to 99, it's 2.56. And they basically passed that point, it's around 2% per year for everybody above 100 LDL. So being below 100 LDL was associated with higher mortality. Never mind, never mind heart disease, cardiovascular disease mortality, or any specific mortality like cancer. We're talking everything, all the mortality. And so I got excited about this. I turned it around to Tommy. He did. He went further. He got us the confidence interval, so you can actually see. For you geeks up here, this is your moment to grab a, a picture, because you can actually see the the harder, deeper data. He is a lot more on the statistician side. Uh, but then, of course, I went to look a little bit further. I wanted to actually get to that triad because I was talking not only about high LDL, I also wanted to see about high HDL and low triglycerides. You can see it improves across every single grouping. I'm going to go back to the prior slide and forward so you can actually see this difference. You see how it improves across the board? Generally speaking, if low-carb diets are helping you improve your HDL and decrease your triglycerides, Again, I'm not, I'm not calling causation, I'm calling correlation. It's correlated with generally a lower mortality. This, by the way, is the population average. For those people over 50 in NHANES, per year, you've got about a 2.3% per year mortality. So those people seeing the higher LDL, they tend to be on the lower end of that. I also did further substratification. Actually, uh, we lose a little more uh, confidence 
If we substratify, that's why I kind of had it grouped into six in the prior one. So I want to caveat that. But as you can see, those people with the highest LDL, the highest LDL, that got measured, but that have to try it, they have not died yet. In fact, they're well below the population average. If you look at this one where I uh, brought the triglycerides down even a little bit more to 80 or less, we now have seven at the furthest end range. Again, this is starting at LDL of 220 in the existing NHANES data set. These aren't even necessarily low carvers. Going up to 280, you actually have everybody surviving as of right now. Average age over there was 75 and 70. I mean, I can only imagine what their doctors are telling them. So, uh, this is, uh, you know, I actually wanted to do one more thing. I wanted to, sh I wanted to look at in, uh, centenarians, because the centenarians were probably the most controversial of the slides that I released on Twitter. And I got a lot of feedback on that. But here's the thing. These are the five last confirmed surviving 100-year-olds. Centenarians is a century, right? And they all have all practically have the triad in common. All have an LDL cholesterol at least above 130. As you can see, one of them has it to 229. They all have above 50 for HDL. And all but one have triglycerides below 100. Which, by the way, happens to match the challenge that I have, from, the low carb challenge that I had from last year. I was looking for specifically this, 50, 100, and 130. And I was astonished to find just how much this exists in the existing centenarians. Once again, I didn't pick five out of random. These are the five that are in the enhanced data currently. Now, the reason there's just five is because in 1999, this was the earliest point in which they had both lipids and mortality being captured. So all of these had their lipids taken in 1999. This isn't when they're being taken now at age 100, no. In 1999, they had these lipids. 16 years later, they're alive, and they're the only ones alive confirmed in 2015. So, here are the criticisms of my analysis, which I have to say I kind of found somewhat amusing. That it was too crude or quick and dirty. That it was lacking proper analysis, and my honest favorite one is that adjusted data is nearly meaningless. Okay, fair enough. I went ahead and started going down, because I had this idea, I wanted to actually see if instead of just those for 100 years or older, why not go ahead and look at each of the ages moving down at least for five years? Because if I did that all the way down to age 95, so the other tenarians, then I would also have another 10 year span from when they would be confirmed alive in 2015. That would be some pretty interesting data, and I'm gonna share that with you now. So this was the 99 tenarians, and you can see, hey, we do have somebody with a low LDL. But they share this category with two people who have super high LDL, 152 and 187. These are the 98 tenarians. And hey, there is. There's somebody with a 55 LDL, but they share that with everybody 100 and above, including uh, one that actually gets up to 186. These are the 97 tenarians. And of course, now that I have so many people, I need to just throw this in a graph. But I'll make this easy for you. Everybody over here, the five bars on the left side, those people have under 100 LDL. Everybody to the right side has over 100. Again, confirmed alive at least 10 years since they were measured. And now we have everybody who are part of the 96 tenarians. 10 on the left, 22 on the right, which, by the way, match the 95 tenarians. So again, we see this association of higher LDL with lower all-cause mortality. And interestingly, this is not the triad. We're back to just LDL, straight up. Now, here's something that gets brought up a lot. What gets brought up a lot is actually, Dave, you're just looking at reverse causation. That was the one other criticism that came up when I was sharing this data, that really what's happening is you're observing a diseased state right before the person passes away. And that that diseased state is what's bringing down your LDL. So what we've been able to look at, the most common explanation could be when it's associated to some cancers, because there are some cancers that can bring down LDL. But generally speaking, their effect size will last within five years. So we excluded everybody who had died within five years of having their lipids taken, and looked only at those people who had survived to at least five years, and then compared the mortality from that. There were nine that were alive, 
and 57 deceased who had an LDL below 100 for a survival rate of 16%. But for those with an LDL above 100, there are 41 alive, 205 deceased with a survival of 20%. I want to do just one more. I love, I love enhanced data. I could just ruminate in enhanced data. I wanted to look at triglycerides. Triglycerides stratified against LDL. So it's gonna be a three-dimensional graph. The higher these bars go, the more there's mortality percent per year. And as you can see, with high triglycerides, if you have low LDL, it's actually a fairly high rate pretty much wherever you go. But that's for LDL below 100. Let's now look at triglycerides stratified, the same sex tiles stratified against LDL of 100 to 150. That looks like this. And interestingly, particularly to me, you can see that there actually is more of a distinctive curve now. You can actually see as you go from the right side of the higher triglycerides to the left, it's getting smaller. So actually the best group off are those people who have triglycerides under 60. They're looking at a nice 1.46% mortality per year. So how about one last tertiary where we look at people with an LDL of 150 or above? They look like this. And as you go from right to left, you can see that not only they're beating out all the other classes, but those people with an LDL of 150 or higher who have triglycerides below 60, 1.02% mortality per year. Quite impressive. Actually, they, seriously, there's so many different ways to cut the enhanced data, but I'm just gonna tell you, and this is a little off script, I'm just gonna tell you there's so many ways in which I see uh, greater mortality at the lower LDL levels. But again, it's an association. I really want to emphasize that in this next slide. Correlation is not causation. So causing yourself to have higher LDL is not when I'm making the claim will give you greater longevity. But epidemiology, while it isn't ideal for proving causation for a hypothesis, that said, epidemiology is good for pushing back on a hypothesis where correlations are the reverse of expectations. You don't need to be an advanced statistician to understand that. Look, if the centenarians I just showed you were binge drinkers, all of them, wouldn't that kind of go against your expectations given with the science that you've come to understand up to this point? It certainly would for me too. What if they were all three pack a day smokers? The only surviving centenarians in the enhanced data set. It would make no sense. And it's because having that reverse correlation is something that we naturally want to be looking toward to better understand what's happening. Obviously, this data is very relevant to people going on a low-carb diet because, of course, we're seeing these patterns. We see so many people, just show of hands, those people who have had their LDL and HDL go up and their triglycerides go down, just those three directions. Yeah, we have <laughs> like two-thirds of the room. Right. So this is, this is very relevant information because at a minimum, you kind of want to understand the correlation. So in summary, look, this is more about you than it is me. I want you to recognize that there is a place, there is a place for organizations that we have in our lives. And they, can, they really can, they can be useful, but just be mindful that they're populated with humans like us. Humans in an organization, they can often get into a commonality of thought, of theories, and that can be tricky. It can be hard for them to get outside of the box. So appreciate that and understand it. Understand also the difference between formal and citizen science. Each has its advantages and disadvantages, absolutely. And never stop engaging others with different viewpoints that are productive. But, and this is the thing I most want to leave you with, please do not understand, do not understate, underestimate. <laughs> this is how important it is, I want to be sure I state it correctly. Do not underestimate your ability to contribute as citizen scientists or be a pivotal patient. If I could ask just one favor, could you give an applause to those people who support our work? Many of them are up here right now. We couldn't do nearly the level of research we've been able to do. Both Siobhan and I are very thankful for our members, and that's my speech. Thank you guys so much.